Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Robbie. Uh, he, him, and uh, we are here with the Gauntlet to play a game called The Pool, which is a game that was written in uh, 2001. That's when it first appeared. Um, I'm going to be the one who is uh, running this game. I have run the game once before, never been a player in it, but uh, I ran it once before and uh, it was a pretty fun uh, and interesting experience. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can all, it does require a lot of creativity on everybody's part. So uh, hopefully everybody has brought some creative muscle with them uh, today. So uh, I'm just gonna go left to right uh, across my screen. And so uh, Fernando, if you want to introduce yourself, Yes, um, I'm Fernando. I go by he, him, and I'll be playing Duncan. Pleasure to meet you all. Okay, and uh, James? Uh, sure, hey, my name is James. I also go by Krom. Uh, I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. I'd like you to use they, them for this, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and I'll be playing uh, Velen. Okay, and Stenter. Hi, I'm Stentor, they, them, and I'll be playing Anti-Pine. Okay. Um, yeah, and we'll hear, we'll hear uh, more about the, the characters uh, in uh, a couple minutes. Uh, I'm gonna go through um, what is called CATS, which stands for Concept, Aim, Tone, and Subject Matter and also uh, talk a little bit about safety. And uh, then we'll kind of get into the rules, get a little bit more into the character creation, introduce uh, more fully our characters and uh, get into the playing of the game. Um, the, the concept of the game, uh, you know, the, the game itself is, uh, doesn't come with a setting. It's really up to the play group to decide upon uh, the setting and who the characters are. Uh, the game doesn't even define what the attributes of the characters are. That's, uh, the, you know, it's a game that's pretty wide open in terms of what it can be about and who it can be about and what the story can be about. Um, so, and I think uh, we are all, for the most part, kind of novices with this game. So I think part of the concept here is just to kind of uh, look back at this game, which uh, uh, packed quite a punch in a small package in terms of uh, its impact on independent role-playing games, uh, brought, introduced a number of ideas that maybe for us will seem kind of like, oh, yeah, of course, but uh, this is a game that kind of set, I think, a number of ideas in motion or clarified a number of ideas. Uh, so that kind of gets into the aim tonight. I, I would say that... that um, in terms of our subject matter, I, I did preempt things a little bit by uh, sharing with the players some uh, pictures uh, and uh, really didn't say anything about the pictures except that, you know, okay, we're in a setting and uh, these are kind of individuals that you might see around the setting. And uh, I think the, it's fair to say that the pictures kind of uh, defined a kind of magical fantasy type uh, setting. Um, it uh, I don't have a picture to, to, to throw on the screen right now, but uh, it had a, a picture of a, of a woman with a fox and a man who seemed to have a very large moth on him and some uh, strange tree people that were walking. And uh, I think there was a... a a figure who was kind of crouching in a stream that seemed to be kind of harmoniously in tune with the the, the pool of water or the stream. Um, so, uh, so we have a kind of magical fantasy setting. I mean, it, it seemed, I, I think uh, it did not seem like a particularly violent setting. Uh, I mean, it seemed kind of uh, bucolic and, and kind of one with nature type magical fantasy setting uh, that was uh, introduced. Um, in terms of uh, safety, um, okay, and uh, Stentor, uh, 
try refreshing the character keeper just to see if if that uh, does it for you because I was a little late on on changing the the sharing uh, setting and it should be uh, done right now. See if that. Uh, Let me just make sure. Is everybody able to to get into the character keeper and edit? I can edit mine. Okay. Stenter, are you uh, you're good? Okay. All right. So in terms of uh, safety, um, the the X card is always on the table, and um, you you should always. Uh, you know, feel free and please do not hesitate to uh, use the the X card if if the game uh, is getting into territory that uh, you know is not going to be good for you uh, and not make things enjoyable. And you don't have to explain uh, the X card. Uh, uh, I guess the only kind of explanation would be as if if I'm not really clear on exactly. Uh, what area we need to avoid. I might ask for a little clarification, but there doesn't need to be any explanation for that. Um, also, uh, lines and veils are are in play. So a veil would be a situation where you say, okay, the subject matter is okay to introduce, but I do not really want to have, um, uh, you know, specific details or descriptions or things of that nature, that would be a veil. And then a line would just be uh, kind of drawing a line on a particular uh, subject matter or area where you would need us to, or you would want us to, to back off from it, rewind a little bit and kind of head in a new direction. Um, I, what I would like to do right now is if everybody can just go into the chat box and if, uh, you want to establish any lines or veils, uh, go on and, and put those in the chat chat box. If if there isn't anything, if you'd still go into the chat, chat box and just uh, acknowledge that you've, uh, uh, you're okay or, or whatever, so. Okay. And, and uh, you know, I would also just request that, that you know, everybody be in for safety. Um, you know, there can be times when uh, something may come up in the chat, for example, and I may have another screen that's up or something like that so that I don't see something. And if, if there's something going on that uh, we need to be alerted to, you know, please, uh, you know, everybody should be kind of involved and engaged in kind of making sure that this is an enjoyable experience for everyone. Um, all right, so let me uh, quickly uh, go through the rules such as they are. Um, so uh, we kind of have a general idea of a setting and uh, the players have uh, each written uh, 50 word stories. And out of those stories, uh, you should now pull out uh, traits that are directly based upon the the description uh, in your story, and and traits can be that a trait is is that's a very broad category for this game. Um, a relationship with somebody could be a trait. Um, 
a certain background that you have could be a trait. A certain type of um, personality quirk or emotional state, that could be a trait. So, I mean, in addition to like if I said, oh, my character is a, a strong lumberjack who has a love for animals, uh, you know, I could pull three traits out of there. Strength, I could pick the, the lumberjack, you know, profession as a trait and a love for animals would be a trait. And, uh, you know, out of out of this, uh, you are going to start to assign uh, points that are going to be based upon your pool dice. You can have a trait up there that has zero points assigned. So, you know, what I would say is just uh, raid your description for as many traits as uh, as you can define, realizing that you don't necessarily have to even assign points to a trait, but at least it, it put it's put up there as a possibility where you would be able to uh, assign points to it. And while you're doing that, I would say that this week we are going to play the original version of the of the pool. There have been a number of variations that kind of tweak the rules in various ways. And so uh, I think with those variations, if if we're interested in the story that we start uh, tonight, we can continue on with the characters and the storylines. But we could, you know, in subsequent weeks, uh, tweak the rules in uh, different ways. So, I mean, it, it might be kind of fun to try out some some different ways of uh, kind of playing the, the game in terms of uh, some of the basic rules. OK, and then uh, everybody starts off with these uh, 15 points that are uh, in the pool. And then what you what you will do now is um you will take those points and uh you can use those points to give yourself bonuses for uh certain of these traits and and the way this works is i'm going to read exactly how it puts it here okay you can assign bonuses to important traits in the form of dice Bonuses increase the effectiveness of traits during play. You do not have to assign a bonus to every trait. To assign a bonus, spend dice from your starting pool. The cost is the bonus itself. Um, thus, now it didn't I need to go through and... Uh, So the cost is, oh, I'm sorry. The cost is the bonus type times itself. That's what I was missing. So a, a plus one trait would just cost one point because one times one is one. If you want a plus two bonus, it's going to cost you four dice or four out of the pool. If you wanted three, a plus three, it would cost you nine. And it says it is very important to leave some dice in your pool. And it suggests at least at least three or four should be left uh, in your pool. Okay. Does everybody understand how that works? So if you want to assign a, a, a plus one to one of those, uh, it would just cost you one. And uh, if you want to assign two, it would be four. You don't, you know, it's fine to leave a trait at uh, zero.
Yeah, and I, I'm I'm a, a novice when it comes to the to the Google Sheet, so I don't have it like automatically calculating. I'll just make sure when you think you're done that everything is. Uh, uh, so Stenter, I think yours is correct. And James, do you prefer James or Chrome, or does it matter? Uh, whatever you're most comfortable with is fine. Okay. I, you're going to see me as Chrome all the time on Slack and stuff, so okay. whatever is easier. Okay. And then <coughs> Fernando. By the way, you can call me Dolan. Dolan, okay. Yeah, it's much easier to say. One, two, three. And uh, I, I think, Dolan, I think you would have seven in your pool, if I'm counting correctly. You have one, two, three, four, six. Hmm. I think so. So you have... Uh, I have four points. And then it, the rank and, ones and two times two is four. Right, and that's eight. So, uh -huh. um, and so you would have seven left, right, in the pool? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Seven. Okay. Okay. Ignore my number for a second. I'm I'm messing okay. around with the formula to see if I can get that automatic, so you can have that for future sessions. Okay. Okay. Bless you, Crumb. Okay, so um, I'll do, then explain how the basic uh, mechanic works for this game. Um, the, the basic mechanic involves uh, rolling a set of dice to resolve a conflict. And it's going to be six-sided dice that you would roll. And to achieve a six, I mean, to achieve a success, you want to roll a one. So if when you're casting the dice, if any of those comes up with a one, you have succeeded. If you don't roll a one, uh, you do not succeed <laughs> in what you are trying to accomplish. OK, uh, so obviously the more dice you roll, your odds of rolling a one increase. If you're only if there's a conflict or something you're trying to accomplish and you're only rolling one dice, there's only a one in six chance that you're going to have success. OK. Um, anyone can call for a die roll whenever a conflict is apparent or when someone wants to introduce a new conflict. And what you do is you just declare that you see a conflict or you want to force a comp conflict uh the, the conflict could be with uh, a character uh or or it could just be some type of challenge that you're trying to overcome okay and either i as the gm could declare a that a die roll is in order or a player could declare that that a die roll is in order and if you declare that you then state uh, the player who's involved in this would state what their intention is, and then they would uh, they would roll the die and see if they if they achieved success. Okay, uh, the GM during this will provide one to three GM dice uh, to add to your throw. OK, and, 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 you know, the rules are so, you know, kind of bare bones. It's like, well, how, how does the GM decide? Part of it might be difficulty. Some of it could be um, story interest. Uh, you know, if 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 a player is declaring something that I find especially kind of interesting or ingenious, I might assign more dice to that role, okay? So there's these these one to three discretionary dice that the GM can assign. If 
if you see this action as being connected to one of your traits, so if if Krom is trying to do something and is saying, oh, this involves my earth magic, Krom would get to assign the bonus points to that. And then you can also gamble up to nine dice from your pool. If you had that many, that would be a lot of dice in your pool. Okay. So there are three things that get added. It's the GM discretionary dice, the, the dice that would be associated with uh, one of the character traits, if those come into play, and then you can gamble uh, dice from your pool. Okay. You figure out how many that is, that many six-sided dice uh, get rolled. And if a one comes up, it's a success. If, if you do not roll a one, Okay, and, and if, if, if you roll a one and get a success, any dice from your pool that you gamble, you get to keep in your pool. If you, if you do not get a success and you gambled some dice from your pool, you lose those dice. Okay? That does not apply to the bonus dice, dice from your traits. You always keep those, okay? But, you know, uh, you, uh, you gamble those dice uh, from your pool to in increase your odds. But if you, the way the game is, is written as it starts out, uh, those, those dice in the pool would get lost. Okay. Um, if you roll successfully, the player who rolled successfully has two options for a successful roll. They can opt to add another die to the pool. So increase that number by one. Okay. Or you can make a monologue of victory. If, if you make the monologue of victory, you get to take over the narrative for a little bit of time and talk about what your victory looks like and you can use that opportunity to introduce some new things or to take the narrative in a certain direction okay uh there are like some basic rules uh, about that monologue of victory so let me just uh go through what the rules say um so the rules say you can do just about anything in the monologue of victory in fact uh these are the only real limitations you must observe. Number one, uh, don't make alterations to the characters of other players, such as killing them. <laughs> right? You can't just say, you know, eliminate or, or, or do something drastic to some other player's character, okay? Uh, you, you can, you are allowed to add complications for them and affect the things around them, but don't intrude on the creation of a fellow player okay so that's one thing that you shouldn't do um but as i say i mean there there's still a little leeway of you can do some things that would have some impact on them that they might need to respond to number two keep your narration in sync with the established facts and tone of the game uh, if you need to ask the gm questions or prompt the other players for responses during your monologue of victory do so and then it says, keep your narration reasonably short, okay? Um, okay, and then uh, going back to what happens if you do not rec receive a success, you lose the dice you gambled, and then secondly, the GM will narrate an outcome that is not what you intended, okay? So if you don't roll a success, uh, you know, the G I, I as the GM would have to think of like some swerve or, or you know, curveball or something that, that kind of happens that is not what you were intending. OK. Uh, you know, I could introduce new complications for your character or simply narrate a scene that is uh, very different from the one that you that you wanted. OK. Um, Oh, okay. Uh, you um, you may add or increase bonuses to traits anytime you wish. 
Okay. So like if, if you at some point say, Oh, I would like to, um, add something to one of your traits from you, what you would have to do is pull points from your pool to do that. Um, okay. And it goes at the same, at the same cost, uh, of dice to do that. Um, uh, and also if another player would like to assign some of their pool dice to a fellow player during a conflict, that will be permissible. So like, you know, if, if, um, Auntie Pine is uh, involved in a dice roll and Duncan and or Velen are like thinking, boy, um, I'll add some of my dice to that. Uh, that would be permitted. But again, the same rules apply. If you're doing that and Auntie Pine does not achieve success, those would count as gambled dice that would get lost. If Auntie Pine gets a success, uh, then those dice would be retained. Okay. Um, uh, there is a rule. I don't know that we need to. There, there is a, a final section on. Uh, you know, your character does not have hit points or uh, or any other measure of life, but characters conceivably can die. Um, if your character fails a role in a situation that the GM de deems utterly lethal, you can either accept death and make a final monologue of victory to describe it, no rolling required, or you can make a final roll to save uh, your life. In this role, you cannot use any traits and the GM cannot grant you uh, any extra dice. All dice must be gambled and your fellow players may may pitch in dice to help that. Okay. I like how it's still the term monologue of victory when you die. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess triumphant, right? Going down in a blaze of glory, right? Um, yeah, and it says if you win that role, your character has survived the incident, but you do not get a monologue. You do not get a monologue of victory if, if it's that role. Um, nor do you get any uh, to add any dice to your pool. You just, uh, you know, the GM will describe how you cheated death. Okay. Uh, so those are the basic rules. Uh, any questions at this point? So when you said a trait could be uh, added to at any time, does that include like right before you make a roll, you just decide, you know, I wanna bump up the skill before I make the roll? Um, you know, it just says you may add um, or increase bonuses to traits anytime you wish. I mean, it, it leaves it, I, according to that, that would be okay if you wanted to do that. Okay. But, but keep, keep in mind that like increasing, uh, it, it does go up exponentially in cost. Right. Um, so, um, so any other questions? Okay. Then, um, are people okay to, to start? I mean, if we want to start, I mean, I'm, I'm curious now if, if people want to break right now or if we want to just kind of go on and launch in and play a little bit and then take a break in a little while after playing. I'm good so, to go. Good to go? Okay. So if if everybody's uh, good to go, why don't we start with this? Um, I'm going to go around and I will have you uh, introduce more fully uh, who your character is. And after we do that, we'll, we'll also, I will establish a little bit more about uh, the setting uh, that we are in right now. So um, 
And I'm going to go left to right across my character keeper now. So, uh, Auntie Pine, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, I guess starting with the little intro story that I wrote says Auntie Pine is an old woman and the fire keeper of the village. She tends the community hearth, which is the source of warmth, companionship, purification, and healing. But she's been sad for as long as anyone can remember because her sister, Auntie Granite, the water keeper, went missing. So my kind of concept here is that uh, she's been part of the village for longer than anyone else that lives here has been alive. And like even the other, like the oldest other people in the village remember her being a really old woman when they were very young children. Um, so whether or not she's like immortal or whatever, uh, you know, kind of up in the air, but she's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and there's this kind of symmetry between her and her sister that's gotten broken because her sister's gone uh, missing. And so, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want me to okay. say and, about it. And, and let me, I'm going to ask, uh, maybe everybody will get one question to cl clarify. Um, what um, what does Auntie Pine remember about the circumstances of uh, Auntie Granite, uh, her departure or going missing or whatever? I mean, is uh, does Auntie Pine have any sense of of what happened? Um, so I'm going to say that she doesn't, um, that they kind of, um, would spend like kind of divide up the time in the village between them and like one would sleep while the other was awake and they kind of like see each other and pass it off, you know, twice a day coming and going. Uh, and so it was just one day she woke up and was expecting her sister to, to be there, and she wasn't. Uh, and nobody else had seen where she went or what happened. Okay. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Velen. Sure. So uh, I'll just go ahead and read my blurb starting out. Uh, Velen is an older man responsible for building construction. As a capable earth magician, he specializes in magic to move and transform the natural world. He has a grumpy streak, but cares for every villager deeply enough to lay his life on the line for them and wants them all safe. Um, obviously, he's nowhere near as old as Auntie Pine. He still is pretty physically fit and stuff. I didn't mark anything down for that because I didn't feel like it fit with my story I ended up writing, but in my mind, he's a pretty hardy guy in general. Um, he, uh, and like I said, he's he's kind of, even though he's kind of grumpy and cold a little bit, he's uh, he cares really deeply for everyone. He's kind of the, the stoic older dude who like makes sure the kids are safe type of person. Okay. And um, why don't you, you tell us uh, about a uh, construction project he's either currently engaged in or has recently been engaged in? Um, let's see. Uh, how about this? The, uh, the town hall that the, the city used to, to um, hold meetings in and stuff uh, is, is, was ancient. Uh, like it was inside of uh, some kind of constructed house and it, the house has just been rotting. And even though they've like taken good care of it, you know, it's, it's time for a new one. So right now he's in the middle of building a new one and uh, there's a large tree that he's got that he is shaping to take its place. Um, how's that sound? That sounds good. So it's probably somewhere more central to the village in general where it's happening. Uh, since it'll be a town hall, mm -hmm. this is kind of how I imagine it. So, okay. Uh, and uh, Duncan. Okay. So the story I wrote for him is that Duncan's life is slow and as he likes it. Born to the dwarf, dwarven clans to the north, 
he moved to the village to put his passion for carpentry and wood carving to good use. He still remembers his days in the watch, uh, in the Watchdorf fondly, and he at times feels brave enough to share his stories at the local tavern. Um, I think that he is this very um, kind, gentle, um, very courteous person. And they're the kind of person that will always be like, good day, goodbye to everybody, regardless of whatever they answer back. And I always, I imagine them like going around with this large hat and sunglasses because he's not used to the sunlight yet. Okay. Um, so he likes to tell stories. Um, let's say during uh, like a festival um, when children, I mean, he's known for telling stories in the village. Um, when, when like children during a festival would approach him for a story, what kind of a story would he, would he relate to children of the village? I think he mostly to children, he tells fables, the kind of things like that have like sentient animals going on adventures, doing good things. And every last one of them has like a nice message at the end, like, Eat your greens. Be respectful to each other. Try and work for the good of the of the whole, not just for yourself. Don't be selfish. Stuff like that. So are these very wholesome tales that if you saw them in a picture book, they will probably be like, um, what do you call these paintings that are like watery and stuff? With the watercolor? Yeah, very much so. Okay. Um, all right, so... Uh, I'm going to uh, establish the name of this village as Wayfront. I'll type it in here. So this will be the village of Wayfront. Um, and this is a, a very old village. Um, it's uh, somewhat isolated. Um, it's in a, a peaceful, picturesque uh uh, valley that has uh, woods and uh, not too far away there are uh, mountains okay that uh, and you know the during uh, during the winter months in particular those shadows of the mountains get particularly long and so you know there are times of the day during the winter that the, the village kind of really feels that it's uh, in the shadows of the mountain. Um, there's a, a small uh, stream that goes by uh, the village. And, you know, that stream is very cold, very clear water. It, it comes down from, you know, smaller springs and, and streams uh, from the mountains and, uh, and passes through the village. Um, the village, I would say it's, it's, quiet, but I would say it's also quite active, uh, that there's a number of families around the village that are involved in uh, farming, uh, some activities that involve uh, going into the, to the forest. Uh, and so, you know, people generally keep uh, busy. It's not like the type of, of village where during the, the middle of the day, you just find a whole lot of people sitting around people are kind of busy industrious uh types that are are kind of uh taking care of their uh business uh just to help establish a little bit more about the setting i'm going to go go around one more time just to kind of get a few more facts out uh about this village of wayfront um auntie pine uh when a newcomer walks into the village what is the first thing that the newcomer would notice? Um, so I'm envisioning this village, you know, since we've got stuff like, you know, working with the, the tree to build the, the town hall and stuff, 
I'm envisioning this as a village that a newcomer might not notice they have walked into at first uh, because so many of the buildings and houses are so integrated with the landscape. And it's like you get most of the way into the village before you're like, wait a minute, you know, this path I'm on seems really unusually flat and clear for a forest path. And oh, wait, that tree next to me is actually a house and that, you know, boulder has a window in it. Um, so, so you don't actually, unless you are familiar with the village already, you don't actually know that you've wandered in until uh, quite a ways. Okay. Uh, and uh, Velen, what makes you feel especially great pride about your village? I am super proud of everybody who's ever grown up here. We've had legendary uh, ambassadors and uh, people who have gone on to do really amazing things out in the outside world. And it always brings a tear to my eye whenever I hear about them doing their thing. Okay. And uh, Duncan. Um... Tell us a little bit about how the village goes about making decisions when there's something kind of important for the community to make some decision about. How does that happen? I think that there is like a circle of elders um, or people associated with the most important professions of the village. I'm gonna go with the second one. And it's usually like an, like an odd number. So it's like five. <laughs> professions that are like the most relevant like the carpenters the farmers the shepherds the miners and i'm gonna say woodcutters too because that's a separate profession the ones that go into the woods and cut the wood and the representative from each of those have to come together on both and since there's always like an odd number of them. There's always the decisions we made. Whatever gets the most votes from those five people gets done. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to start uh, with um, an ordinary day. What seems to be an ordinary day. Um, so we would have um, we would have Velen uh, working on the town hall construction. Um, we would have what would Duncan be doing like in the in a afternoon on an ordinary day? What what uh, what would Duncan be doing? I think that he, most days, like his normal routine, takes him to work for Be for Bellum. Okay. For Bellum, sorry, and he he just enjoys the manner of labor. So he's probably working in some new construction work that needs to be done, some repairs that need to be made. Okay. And uh, Auntie Pine, it's like early afternoon. What would you be? typically doing in an early afternoon on a typical day? So I think she spends most of her time uh, tending that hearth. Um, so it's a place that, you know, it's a place that people congregate in the village if they've got, you know, stuff to do. They don't have to be anywhere else particularly. Um, it's where pe a lot of people come to cook their food um, because even if they might have like a private hearth in their, their house, um, there's kind of a, a community spirit. People like to, to cook together over the big community hearth. And so she kind of tends the hearth and settles any minor disputes that might come up among people. Uh, you know, keeps an eye on some of the children that are running around while their parents have other stuff to go and do. Okay, so uh, you're tending the hearth, and um, a woman uh, in her 40s 
uh, approaches, uh, she is weeping, uh, very upset. Uh, you know her. She, her name is uh, Visal Windersorn. Uh, she and her husband Wyden run run the mill of the village, um, and. A little bit about her history. Um, she and her husband uh, use uh, pack animals to to operate the mill. Like they have a, you know, it's the kind of mill where you would hook up. They usually use donkeys. Okay, they have these donkeys that they will set up to the mill, and the the donkeys when it when the mill needs to run, they the couple donkeys will kind of operate, provide the the muscle to turn to the the millstone. Uh, she uh, and her husband uh, used to have a mill that was uh, close to the center of the village. But um, a few years ago, they moved the mill uh, so that it would be a little bit more isolated. Um, they have a daughter who is uh, so so this this couple they're they're in their 40s. They, they um, really hard working, very serious, um, very dependable. They are, um, uh, very fit looking, uh, you know, that they, they, uh, you know, they, they, um, are, you know, slender, but you can, you can see that they're strong. They have a lot of stamina. Um, they have a daughter who is 19, uh, and who helps them in operating the mill. And they also have a son who uh, is 17. The reason why they moved out of the village was because of their son. Their, their son, uh, even though this isn't really a, a, a really big village, he, he just n didn't seem to be able to uh, operate very well with a lot of act, any kind of noise or activity really disturbed him. So they decided, oh, well, we'll, you know, we, we, we have donkeys, we can move the donkeys out and we can still operate our mill. And um, this, uh, this all's appearance uh, involves her son and his name is uh, Strain. And she says to you, I don't know what to do. Strayan, um, he, he's gone missing. And, and it's not like the usual missing. I mean, he, he's, he likes to go kind of wandering out by himself out in the woods and, and, you know, be gone for a few hours, but he always kind of comes back. But uh, last night, yesterday afternoon, he went walking we expected him back early evening, but he didn't come back, and and we don't know what to do. So I think I start by like you know I put an arm around her. I give her I have like an endless supply of handkerchiefs and stuff, and I give her one to like wipe her her face with. And I sit her down near the fire, and I get some uh you know there's somebody that's baking some bread and i get you know a, a little like a um you know roll from them and, and give her something to uh party to eat and um kind of listen to her as she as she gives the whole story there um yes so she continues to to talk and and she she says you know um Strayan really was no good operating the mill because the the kind of sound of the grinding and and all of that really kind of disturbed him. So, you know, we we always let him just kind of go off and 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 do what he wants to do. That the kind of piece of our uh, of our area really uh, kind of seems to appeal to him. But you know, and, and we could always count on him to come back. I mean, this is just not not like him to go kind of wandering off and he knows the area. I mean, he, he's, we've been out there for a few years now, but you know, yesterday afternoon, late in the afternoon, he goes wandering off. We, you know, 
we always expect him back for dinner and he, he never came. And, and this morning he wasn't there. We were waiting a few more hours and uh, my husband is out, you know, kind of searching the, the surroundings, but, you know, we haven't been able to turn anything up and, and we, we need some help. Yeah. So I think that, you know, as she's telling this story, uh, Auntie Prime is kind of running through in her head who in the town would be best equipped to, uh, to handle something like this. And the two people that come to mind are uh, Velen and Duncan. And so I think she tells one of the kids that's hanging around to go fetch them so that, uh, so that they can be uh, called on to help. Okay, so so uh, this happens, and uh, the 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 kid goes kind of running up, and I, I think uh, he would go to the kid would go to Velen first because he he knows um, that uh, you know Duncan can be kind of around at different things, but he knows that that Velen is there at the town hall and that's like a central thing. And so, uh, Velen, this, this kid comes running up to you and says, Velen, uh, uh, Antipine, uh, needs you that, uh, yeah, this all, uh, came into the, uh, to the hearth area and she's like really sad and says she needs some help. And, uh, Antipine sent us here to get, you and uh, and Duncan and uh, I think she wants you to to to, to try to help. Uh, okay, um, I uh, bend over to the kid and then look at him with a, a stern face, nod my head, and say, "Okay, kiddo, I'll uh, I'll make sure I go and see her." Um, what did he say? Anything else other than just telling me Auntie Pie needs me? Uh, yeah, uh, he he also relayed that that uh, this involves Vissel, that that Vissel is with Antipine, and is in a, a very emotional state, and needs some help. Okay, I imagine I already have a feeling it relates to her son, given how I tend to be in in people. I tend to know about people even if I'm not in their life, so. Um, I, uh, I, I pat the kid and, um, and, and he guess, does, yeah, he does ask if, if you know where, where Duncan is because Auntie Pine wants Duncan as well. Well, I think Duncan's just right over here. He's helping me, uh, with the new town hall here. So I'll gather up my men and send them off for lunch and tell them that work might be over for the day. So if I'm not back within a couple hours that they're free to go home, um, so I guess that's that's exactly what I do, and I pull in Duncan first to to give him a heads up. Uh, so I, I go and I find Duncan. I say, Duncan, hey. Yeah. Good day, Governor. How uh, how are you doing? Uh, I'm I'm okay. Uh, it sounds like uh, there's some trouble with the Winterstorm family, and uh, we've been asked to help. So. Uh -huh. uh, would you care to give me a hand while I gather up the rest of the men and send them off? Sure, sure. It, certainly, sir. All right. Uh, talk to this kid and see if he needs anything else. I'll go handle the the, the men. And so I, I walk off and I'm gathering the rest of the men. Okay. And women. Duncan goes to tell the other people, like, hey, we have the situation, lunchtime. Uh, and then he grabs his hat, he grabs his glasses, he grabs his cane, and he does himself off from all the wood chippings and begins to make his way towards um, Auntie Pines. Okay. So, yeah, you all uh, get to, to Auntie Pines, and Vissal is, uh, you know, she's had a little bit of time to calm down, but she's still uh, very concerned. And when she sees you, she she seems a little bit relieved. I mean, but but it's like, oh, thank you so much. Uh, and and she relates what's happened that uh, this their son Strain has has gone missing, and he didn't come home in the evening, and he didn't come home in the morning, and hours went by. And uh, the husband is out searching the woods around their place 
but there's there's no sign right now of strain. Um, I think Duncan is going to try to reach out um, and ask her a couple of questions. He probably dealt with some missing cases back in the Oregon lands, uh, missing people cases. And he just wants to know, is there a place that he has told you that he likes to go to when he goes on these walks? Um, anything that he has mentioned about the forest lately that could help us find him, stuff like that. Uh, she says that, um, well, it is the case that his walks seem to have been getting longer, that, that, you know, he, but he's growing up. I mean, he's 17 years old, but it is the case that recently he would go out for longer periods of time. And he would also had started to kind of bring back things that he had found in the forest. They were, they were usually, you know, kind of branches and uh, leaves that he had gathered and things of that sort. And he had kind of gone back to his room, kind of collecting those things that that's kind of a, a new thing. She, she never really has been able to get out of him exactly what he was doing on these walks. I, I just felt like, she says, I, I just felt like, you know, it was peaceful for him. He would always come back and seem uh, kind of content and relaxed. So I never really thought there was anything that was dangerous or anything. Duncan very calmly lets her know that they will find him. He probably just went a little far and he's probably just enjoying the scenery. He's probably safe. And that she better stay here, rest up, drink some water. And he'll just look at Auntie Pine, look at Pelan, and not knowingly. Um, I, I'm thinking because Duncan, one of your your traits is heart, and you seem to be showing some heart right now. Yes, I am. Um, and and you you have this this woman who is upset. Um, why don't we go on and and have you roll? Definitely. And uh, I'm going to give you uh, three of my discretionary dice, and then you would have. Uh, five, uh, you know, with the, with the two heart, that would give you five dice to roll. Um, yes. I, I'm, I'm, you know, what, what exactly would you try to be, would you be trying to accomplish here? What is your objective with this? I think um, mostly to calm her down, give her like some comfort, ensure that her distress is not exasperated by the situation as a mother will usually get exasperated when a child goes missing. Um, hopefully give her some, some trust in that we will actually be able to find her son. Okay. And uh, with this, did you, um, did you, did, did you roll that? Yes, I just okay. rerolled them. Okay, so so you have a success. Yes. Uh, so uh, you get an option of either adding a die to your pool, or you can take a monologue of victory. Okay, I think I'm gonna take the dice for now. Okay, so you you add one die to your pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'll I'll narrate, but you know it's a victory. Uh, she really feels the warmth that is, and, and the calmness that is radiating from you. And, uh, she's, she's no longer weeping. Uh, she, she really, uh, is getting a little optimism and says, this village has always come through for us. And 
um, I'm still concerned, but um, you know, I, I, I feel like you're right that, that, you know, we, we will find him. Uh, but I think we should hurry and, and, you know, I, I can take you to our, to our mill and, and uh, my husband is there and we can see if he's, if he's found anything. So I think at this point I'd I'd speak up and I'd say, so you said your son didn't like them to be around the mill uh, and was bringing things home. Would it be better perhaps to take a quick look at his uh, room before we moved on so we could see what kinds of things he was bringing back to see if there's anything different about them? Yeah, I I, I mean, any clue that we can find, I, I, I agree, uh, yeah. Um, Perhaps it'd be better to have the, the father with along with us, though. So the mill first. Yeah. Well, well, the 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 house is is next to the mill. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. So so yeah, they 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 kind of moved the whole family. So they have like the mill operation, and then they have a a, a, a nearby a nearby home. So yeah. So why don't we uh, kind of fast forward it up there to the mill, and um, the. So, you know, it has two two buildings. One is the building that has the mill operation going on in it. And then you also have a separate kind of cottage that is set up. It's it's a very scenic uh, place. Uh, you know, as you walk up, you you smell these flowers. And when you, you know, even before you arrive at the cottage, you smell these flowers. But when you see the cottage, uh, there are, you know, these these purple blooms that have been planted around, uh, you know, that the, the family obviously likes the, the kind of doing some gardening. And uh, the, the mill is not currently operating. Uh, the I mean, it has been operating, but but it, it's uh, the the husband has been uh left the, the mill to kind of go wandering around. And, and as you kind of walk up, uh, this all, uh, you know, yells for, um, widen, you know, widen, widen. Are you here? Are you here? I've brought help. I've brought help. Um, you, no response right now. Um, you know, Ben, she says, well, you know, he, he, he was said, said he was going to go into the woods. So I, I, I assume that he's off, in the woods, but, um, you know, I can take you to, uh, Strayan's bedroom if you want. you mentioned wanting to look at what he had brought back with him. Yes. I'd, I'd love to see his room. Okay. So she, she, she will take you, um, to the room. Uh, he has a very kind of small room, very simple with uh, a cot, uh, and a, you know, chair there. He has, some uh little wood boxes slid underneath the the cot and uh she pulls pulls these out and they are you know filled with um uh all sorts of you know bark and uh branches twigs uh at, you you can kind of see at the bottom that there's some clothes down there but they've largely been kind of filled up almost to overflowing with uh, these. And, and there is, uh, you know, when you get in there, I mentioned that this kind of fragrance smell of, of flowers, there, there is in this room uh, a, a very strong woodsy smell that kind of everybody kind of notices this strong woodsy smell coming. Like it changes. Yes. Okay. And, and it's kind of surprising because it, 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 you know, that, 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 the, the smell of the blossoms was pretty strong, but, you know, here, right. That kind of woodsy smell is, is, uh, po powerful enough to, uh, kind of overcome the, that fragrant smell of the flowers. So Duncan, what do you do? Um, uh, I ask, um, Belen and undefined, like, uh, I can smell some wood coming mm. from this room. Um, it's very overpowering, right? I'm not the only one smelling that. No, you're not. Yeah. So as 
as the village firekeeper, I feel like I would probably be able to, to tell a lot about stuff by the smell of the wood. Since I probably, since I've worked with a lot of wood to keep that fire going, would that would that be fair? I think? I think I think that is fair. I mean, you you know you you would okay. know, you would know your your wood as the fire keeper. Certainly, what you know. Okay, so I should I, yes. make a roll there to see what I can see what I can smell? Yeah, and um, I'm going to give you three discretionary dice, um, okay. and part of that also has to do with you know how long you've been around. So you're you're very familiar with the the woods that grow uh, in this area. You've been around mm -hmm. for a long time. Okay, so that's six total then, because I've got a Correct. three in my firekeeper. All right. And Let's see, and I, I got four ones, so <laughs> I think I made it. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Okay, so, yeah, yeah, I, so so either I get to narrate it or I get or die from my pool and you narrate it. Correct. Um, I'll take the die from my pool just because I want to see where you are going with this. Uh, <laughs> like I could make up my own thing, but I kind of want to see what you were hoping to be hinting at with this. The smells. Okay, so um, you know, you pick up the smells and uh you know, you start kind of looking through some of this vegetation that, that he has been bringing home. For the most part, it looks like the typical trees and plants from the area. But occasionally, uh, you come across um, pieces of wood and those pieces of wood are different. I, I think to, to somebody who didn't know the area, didn't right know the history of this area, they would not necessarily pick it out as different, but you do because you recognize this wood as belonging to some type of entity that the village just calls the wooden. And uh, I had shared in the pictures these kind of animated looking uh, wooden people. Did you see those? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it kind of looks like, you know, pieces of driftwood that are somehow melded together. Um, this is, these are kind of entities that um, they don't really appear in the village, but people that go into the forest occasionally come across them. They don't really communicate. Um, they, they don't really bother people. Uh, they seem a little curious about them, but also wary of them. And um, they tend to be in the deep forest. Uh, even though you've been around for a long time, uh, you're even you don't really know exactly what their history is. You just kind of know that oh, there are these what the village calls the wooden, and they are out there in the deep forest um, as to where they came from, what they are. Uh, the village doesn't really know. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain all that to, um, to Duncan and Velen. Okay. Uh, d are you are you gonna let um, this all hear what you're saying about the? I, I think so. I mean, I think I, I frame it in a, a as non alarming a way as I can. Um, okay. But I don't feel, I don't think the anti pine really wants to 
you know, keep any secrets. Uh, she doesn't believe in like trying to trying to like help people by sheltering them from things. Um, she'd rather like help you okay. help you address the truth than to protect you from it. Okay. Uh, so you know, she um, as you relate this, you know, Vissel is concerned. She's like at the wooden they they've never you know caused a any trouble and it's it's very odd to see pieces like that in here um it, it sounds like he was going off to the north i mean at least when when we've been around it it's up to the north that we've occasionally run across the wooden I firmly believe that uh, if he goes back so often, perhaps he's befriended them. I don't believe that anyone would be able to get a piece of the wooden without it being given willingly. So, uh, yeah. do you think that, I mean, what do you think we should do? I, I Should we wait for my husband or... or well, truth be told, it's getting late. Perhaps we could use some lanterns to go into the forest, make sure that we come back before nightfall, and make sure that we try to bring John's train back with us. Uh, yeah, that, that, Vizzle says that, that sounds great. I, I have some lanterns here if you, uh, if you'd like to use them. And she kind of go, goes running off to get some some lanterns. So what I'm, what I'm thinking, um, I have a coming up uh, 922. Uh, this might be, it sounds like we're, we may be getting ready to kind of leave the, this to go out uh, into the, to the surrounding woods. Uh, would it be good to take a, like a five minute break right now? Okay. So why don't we yep. take a five minute break and then we may uh, be up for a little uh, expedition out into the woods. That's right. good.
Hello. All right. Um, so, um, this all comes back with uh, some lanterns. And also, at this point, um, Wyden, her husband, has, has come back. Wyden is looking very concerned. Um, and he says, I've, I've been far, far into the forest, all around, looking at those places where my son would go that I knew of, and nothing, nothing. And, and now it's getting dark again. I, I don't know. I mean, he's, he can take care of himself to some extent, but, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, he can't survive by himself just alone out in the woods. And, and, and Vissel has, has kind of let them know that uh, you have arrived to help. And he says, I, I would appreciate any, any help that you could offer. But I, I've come up with nothing. There, there's not a trace out there. I think Auntie Pine gives him like a, a comforting like arm around the shoulder uh, to, to reassure him that we, we've got it under control. We're gonna we're gonna make sure that his son is safe. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it it is getting dark. Do you do you think? I mean, if you want to stay here for the evening and and set out in the morning, that's that's fine. No, I I think the sooner we find your son, the better. It's Besides, true. Dark and ice are good in dark. <laughs> I, I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that dwarves can see good in the dark. So, as as firekeeper, could I summon some fireflies to light our way? Uh, yeah. If you want to try to try to kind of do some of that uh, fire light magic, that sounds that sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, so and and uh, I'll do that thing. I would say uh, I'll give you two of the discretionary dice, GM. Okay. All right, so that's five of them. Oh, no, no ones. Okay. But you didn't gamble any dice. So. I didn't gamble any, no. Okay. All right. So, you know, um, you you do uh, – describe the kind of ritual that you would do to, to summon some fireflies. Um, so I think that I, I pull out, I have just some, some twigs that I, I keep in my pocket and I would kind of like rub them together in my hands, kind of, you know, how you rub sticks to, to start a fire and kind of whisper to it, um, that I'm looking for the fireflies. Okay. And, and I would say um, this is normally something that is um, that you're able to do, uh, mm -hmm. at least, you know, where where the hearth is. Uh, this is not a, a, a particularly difficult ritual for you, but the fireflies do not come. You do not notice any any fireflies around this area. Now, granted that this. You know, as I said, they had they had moved out of the village a little ways. Um, so this is not like the, the area that you would normally do this. But it does seem a little mm -hmm. odd to you that uh, no no fireflies are here. Uh, you know, they, mm -hmm. they have they have lit their it, you know, it's starting to get a little dark and they have lit their their lanterns, though. And uh, I'm um, I'm I'm startled as a fellow practitioner of magic. I understand that she performs this fairly regularly. So 
for me to see her fail to summon any is uh, a little bit of an omen. I don't say anything, but I'm visibly startled for a moment. Duncan actually goes to Auntie Pine and he grabs her, like puts his meaty dwarven hand on her hand and just says very like softly, like we all have moments like that sometimes. You'll be best, better next time. Yeah, she's uh, so thank you. Uh, I just, maybe I just need to get some new twigs or something. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Um, kind of sticks it back in her, her pocket. We can search for those tomorrow. I will help. Okay, thanks. So, um, before we set out, I, I make sure to gather all of the, uh, the, uh, wooden, uh, twigs. Okay. I want to make sure that we have them all on me. Um, and before we actually set out, uh, I, I actually want to do a little bit of a ritual. Um, I, I let everyone know this, that I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a few minutes here in order to, to make sure I'm doing this right. Um, cause it's not something I normally do, but I want to try to communicate with the twigs using my magic to see if there's something I can glean from them. Okay. Um, about whether they've like contacted him or anything like that. Um, so is that something I should roll then? Uh, yes. Um, and so you, you, you want to know specifically if, if these twigs have had contact with, um, with Strayan? Yeah. And if, if the, if so, like, where will I be able to find where he might have been gone? Cause okay. Obviously, they've they've had contact with him. It's so it's it's like a matter of how asking them to help me find him, basically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to. In terms of the traits, which uh, which trait do you think this would? Um... I was thinking earth magic because these are magical creatures, and it require my magic to communicate with them in this way. Right. Because okay. they're not collected together, so I can't imagine them being like a fully sentient thing. Mm -hmm. So it'd require magic for me to understand it. It's not like I'm like, you know, communicating with it. It's I'm intuiting right. what from the source, basically. Okay. All right. So so you'll get two uh, dice for that, and you'll get two dice from the GM. And then you can either roll with the four, or if you want to gamble any... Of your pool, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna gamble one. Okay, so that would so, give you five to roll. Yep. So I just hit five on the d6 and then submit. Um. Oh, that doesn't look right. What did I do? Um. So, um. Did Did you roll or? Because what you can do is select. Like I see in roll for the party that there are five dice there. You can you can you know click on all of those and roll and do re-roll selected. Uh, you... how about I just hit clear and then re-roll them? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Clear all dice. There you go. Five. Submit. Hey, I got a one. Okay, so um. So you can either, so, you, you know, the gamble dice, you, you keep those, you keep the one that you gambled, you don't lose it. And you can either add a, a die to your pool, or if you want to do a monologue of victory, you can do that. I want to do a monologue of victory. Okay. Um, so I, I commune with these things and... I Im immediately get this feeling of attachment from them and this feeling of like welcoming a child home, that kind of thing. Uh, I feel like as if these wooden people have embraced him as he is and they've accepted them, which is why they're w they were willing to part with these pieces of them. Uh, it's something I'm really startled by because nobody's ever made contact with these creatures before in such a way. And for them to demonstrate this feeling of community uh, really strikes home for me. So 
uh, reaching further into this, I I kind of follow back and get a feeling of just sort of what to expect out of this. And there's, uh, I kind of feel like going north is the way that they that he was going, and that there's this sort of sense of almost urgency about like having him there. And I don't really understand it, but I feel like if we go north and we make sure that we are able to find where he went, um, that we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to, you know, be able to locate him. Like I, that's, that's that feeling of confidence I have from that. But there's something underneath there that I'm, I don't know how to understand that's like, it's almost like a feeling of like they needed him, right? Like if, uh, like the way that, um, uh, what was her name? Sorry, Vissel, uh, like how Vissel needs her son back. Like that kind of, I get that same kind of feeling. Okay. And I immediately tell this to everybody. I relate to to everyone that uh, uh, this is what they've communicated with me, and that I'm very certain that he's safe. Okay. So I'm curious uh, as to how how your companions react. I think Duncan is visibly happy at this. Like, okay, the boy is safe. That's good. So now we just have to bring him home. We should probably not tell the parents yet. We don't want to raise their hopes too much. Yeah, I think Auntie Pine is very encouraged by that news uh, because she's not not a big fan of antagonistic relationships in the the region. So and. Uh, you know, kind of excited that, you know, because as long as she's been around, you know, nobody's had contact with with these uh, individuals. Um, they've always been kind of on the periphery of things and wrapped up in various sorts of, you know, boogeyman stories and stuff. Um, so it's, you know, in a way kind of exciting that something fundamental about the the village might change. Uh, the only other time anything, you know, fundamental about the, the life of the village changed and since she's been around has been when her sister disappeared. Um, so. Okay. Um, so I guess right now I, I would want to ask, are you, the, the, the sun has been setting. Uh, so um, it sounds like you're, you've got this, you know, idea that up, you know, Strayan is, is up north somewhere. Are you uh, wanting to step, set out now uh, as the sun is setting or are you, and, and they have offered uh, for you to stay the night if you, if you want to stay the night in the cottage. Um, I actually speak up and say, I think we ought to take up their offer to spend the night with them, uh, if at least to give them company, but also to raise their spirits. I feel that uh, I'm certain we will be able to, uh, you know, relieve them of their worries if we are to, to spend the evening with them. I think that makes sense. Yes, I uh, hate some folks, but they have been kind to us, so if the kid is safe, the both we will wait until daylight comes. Okay, yeah, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're more than happy to, you know, and they understand, right, that, that right, uh, the nighttime would make it difficult to kind of make your way into the forest. Um, so you know they they uh, set up they they do have their their daughter Vixa who is there they um, they 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 seem you know pretty they seem concerned but they're comforted they're they're also you know happy to kind of uh, cook you up a a, a nice meal for uh, the evening and uh, 
I guess you, you can let me know if anybody wants to do anything else in the evening or if we just want to fast forward to um, the next morning. But if anybody wants um, to the evening, let me know. I, I think most of what I'm doing is I still have those twigs with me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really particularly like present in the conversations. I feel like I, I feel like there's something in the wooden that's like resonating with me. Uh, and I, I'm having trouble like, understanding it. So uh, pretty much I'm a little distant from all of the conversations and I pick up right away when people like address me and things like that. But uh, I'm, I'm feeling some, some kind of pull here that I can't explain that I've never felt before. Like the kind of pull of like wanting to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. As a lifelong resident, I've never felt that before. So, okay, yeah, and, and I would say that you're, you know, you pick up, um, yeah, you kind of pick up some like direction from this as to like where, where, roughly speaking, you know, where that pull is coming from. Okay, so uh, anything else for the evening, or should we? Fast forward to the next morning. I think the only remarkable thing will be Duncan trying to distract his family with stories of his dwelling home, but that's about it. Okay. D do you want to roll for that? You have a storyteller uh, ability. Yeah, I think I'm just retelling some tales of old. Okay. Something to inspire them, to distract them from this whole situation. Okay. So why don't you go on and roll for that? I'll give you three uh, GM discretionary dice. Okay, I'm rolling for them. Ah, my stories were not particularly good today. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I guess um, what, you know, they... they I, I guess what I would say is that they're they're tired and uh you know they the you know you 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 want to perhaps entertain them with your stories uh instead your stories uh put them to sleep <laughs> and and that's they you know because you know Wyden has been you know they've they've emotionally been very upset and you know you know the the husband has been out you know wandering through the woods uh, he's exhausted. So, you know, you start telling these stories, which usually perk everybody up, their entertainment, they, they kind of just go dozing off, okay? Um, but, you know, the next, the, 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 the sun rises the next morning, they, they get up, they, they put together some, uh, some food for you, and, uh, you know, they're, they're excited for you to kind of set off to see if you can find Strayan. There's still been no sign of, of Strayan. It seems like a normal evening, right nothing out of the ordinary but you know they get up the next morning they're they're kind of they're moving quickly they're getting some food together for you but they they're kind of eager to kind of see if uh if you're able to kind of uh locate their son yeah um i don't know if this skill would apply but i do have watch dwarf which i think will apply to, you know, searching for people that go missing. That's things that watchmen do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try and search for you as to where he might be. Um, what do you think? Yeah, so, so you want to you wanna, um, take the lead in terms of, of kind of setting off um, yeah. You know, I would say that that Velen, it's it's not like a, a GPS or something like that. You don't no. really have to really, um, you know, uh, you know, with the pull uh, that that Velen has from the wooden pieces, uh, it's just a general sense of you know going north. But uh, if you all um, you all set off into the woods in the early morning light, and uh, Duncan, you are uh, kind of taking the lead as you head off uh, to the north. And so if, uh, and, and so uh, what, what is Duncan with the watch dwarf? What is the intent 
that you have in mind. You do have you do have special you know abilities. I think that you get as a result of this history of of being a watcher. Mm. So what are you trying I, to accomplish? I think yeah. Um, I think I'm trying to get them um, to whatever we're going, like using Duncan as a general guide in the most ex in the fastest way possible, the most efficient way possible. So we don't get sidetracked with the regular flora and fauna of the forest. Okay. Maybe using some roads that I have traveled myself, searching for good wood that I will have used for, you know, passwords that I have done. Okay. I'd also say that like with my ability to uh, make sure we're not going the wrong way, that if he, if I feel like he is, starting to take us too far away, I'd probably be able to help course correct as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what I, what I think I'll do is, is, um, uh, you can roll two with that watchdorf trait. And since, uh, Velen also has the kind of pull of these pieces, I'll give you the, the three discretionary dice, which would give you five and you can decide if you want to, uh, gamble anymore or if you're good with five i think i'm gonna gamble one so okay. one extra time. so let's reroll all of these no what's happening no don't disappear Like they all got stacked together for some reason. And you can also just clear them all if you want to and just roll the. Yeah, yeah, got them. They're all selected. I rolled two successes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you, you don't lose the gambled die, and you can either add a, another die to your pool, or if you want to take a monologue of victory, you can do the monologue of victory. Yeah. I'm gonna use the monologue. So I think what happens is that we have this tribal montage of all three of us, like crossing creeks, um, using some fallen trees as as bridges. There are probably some of these these creatures, like in the in the foreground of the scenes, like they're probably watching us go. We probably don't notice them as we pass them by. Um, and I imagine like all three of us like helping each other so on the road and then help on the pine. And at some point I, I imagine us having to stop to like eat some bread, some cheese by a creek, watch our faces. And I think we come across these these ring of stones on a clearing in the forest, maybe. And there's nothing inside the ring, but it's clearly like something was, like it was placed here. It doesn't seem like a natural formation stone. Okay. Uh, so you got this curious ring of stones that you have come across and um, you do see, um, in the center of the ring, some articles of clothing. Uh, you see a shirt, you see some shoes, um, you see, um, a, a hat there, sitting in the center of the ring. So, uh, Duncan, what do you do? Um, I look at the clothes and he looks puzzled and now he, look, now he looks concerned and he looks to um, to Velen, be like, 
Um, Mr. Velen, um, I don't know what we expected to find, but I certainly did not expect to find the young man's um, vestments. What does the poll, what, what am I feeling from it? Um, you still feel it pulling even, you still feel it pulling north. I, I would say the pull as you've gone along has get become steadily stronger. You know, as, I would also say that as you approach those clothes, uh, they look wet. Huh. The clothes are wet? And it wasn't raining, was it? No, it was not raining. Okay. Was there a river that flowed through here at all that we noticed? Uh, you've really been... Uh, you've been getting up, like, a slightly higher ground, so... There, there's not really a river that you know of in this area, although this is an area that, that you, you all really haven't been in because you're getting kind of pretty deep in the forest up here to the north. Well, um, I guess I just say, well, uh, I, I still feel like where these, where this connection is leading me is still further to the north. So I'm not sure what to make of this this clothing, but I still don't have a bad feeling about this. Perhaps he won't be as we expect him to be because of this now, though. So, uh, Auntie Pine, do you have any uh, reaction? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Auntie Pine is concerned about what the wet, uh, wet clothes mean. Would she, uh, I'm guessing she probably hasn't personally been this far from the village, uh, to see this kind of stone arrangement, but since it is something very old, I'm wondering if she might have some insight into what the this place is where we're finding the clothes at least okay so uh why don't you roll with your old yeah and um i'll give you two of the discretionary dice for this okay so that's that would give three. you three mm -hmm. And just for the heck of it, I'll, I'll gamble one into this. Okay. Um, since. All right. And I did get a one. Okay. So do you want to okay. add a, a die or do you want to take a monologue of victory? Um, yeah, let me take a monologue of victory. And define what this uh, this place is. Um, so I think this kind of this stone circle area I recognize as being um, it's it was something left over from the builders, who are the people that are the beings that kind of created our world and our our village is actually founded on a place where there was a, a similar kind of um you know similar kind of construction left over from the builders and this was long even before my time so it's not like i knew it any knew it like personally but you know i remember the stories being told um and you know i i'm kind of like i didn't realize there was another uh another remnant of the builders this far this far out um and you know this place must still have some of their power 
in it if it's remained uh, kind of standing here. And I'm not sure what they would want with a child uh, or a child's wet clothing. Um, but the stories, none of the stories suggest that the builders were hostile or, or harmful. They just, they kind of made our world and, and moved on. Um, and the world is kind of infinite because they keep making more world everywhere that they go. But it's been a very, very long time since they passed through this part of the world. Okay. Um, yeah, and the forest around this area, it's it's very peaceful and tranquil. I mean, you can you can hear birds occasionally in the in the canopy, and you can see you know forms flying up there in the canopy, um, and yeah, and and I mean, as you've kind of gone up this area, it, it has become pretty dense. The foliage. Um, I would also say that you, like, as you're standing there, uh, you do pick up, um, you do pick up a, a smell and it's not a, it's not a, a foreign or strange smell, but you know, it definitely has a kind of, uh, a kind of pungent woodsy smell that seems a little different. Right. I mean, it's kind of seems a little bit stronger, this kind of uh, pungent woodsy smell as you're standing there in the middle of the of the circle. And it does look like an old circle. It doesn't look like this circle was put there uh, recently. I mean, the, 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 the stones look kind of worn down from the elements uh, that it's been been here for eons it seems so what do you do you know and you do and you do have the the wooden you know still definitely pulling north yeah so i, I think anti-pying kind of gathers up the clothes Kind of rings them out a little bit, um, puts them in in her bag. Okay, and when um, when you do that, um, they they seem wet, but they also seem. Um, you can tell that there's also sap in there. Okay, like you get that, mm -hmm. you, know, you pick them up, and you've got you know that kind of sticky sap mm -hmm. uh, feeling in them as well. Okay. Yeah, so she puts them in her bag and gets one of her handkerchiefs out and <laughs> wipes her, her hands um, and then suggests that we ought to, if, if we're being pulled north, uh, we should probably continue. Okay, okay, let's do just that. Okay, so yeah, yeah. You, you, you head north and... Um, you have Duncan still taking the the lead, and um, I would say it's not too too much longer as you kind of leave that that stone ring that you uh, you do hear some rustling up ahead and um you hear a you hear a voice um i mean the voice is something you know it's not articulate but just uh uh uh, uh kind of sound that's coming up ahead of you I immediately move between it and the rest of the party. And I say, uh, what should we do? What is that? Uh, it doesn't sound friendly, honestly. 
Um, Duncan is like shaking a little as he grabs his cane with both hands. You think it's an animal? I don't know. You know, why else? Last time we anybody seen like a wolf or anything here? This is supposed to be, you know, safe. I uh, I use my uh, trait protective of others in order to investigate, since I'm doing this in order to defend my party. Um, okay, so um, so you're you're trying to impose yourself between whatever this this is in front of you and the party to take a protective stance. Yes, and uh, moving forward slowly to to see if I can figure out what is making this noise. Okay, as I move uh, through the foliage. Okay. So why don't you uh, roll and you'll get the two for the protective of others. And you will also get uh, two of the GM dice for this. And then you can decide if you want to roll any, uh, if you want to gamble any. Um, yeah, I'll take a gamble. I'll, I'll do a, a five okay. total. Okay. So that's just one. And the green there looks like I rolled a one. Okay. So uh, what do you want? Do you want to take the monologue of victory or do you want to add a die? I think I'll take the die. Okay. Okay. So, so you, um, you take that protective stance and as you kind of work, work your way up, um, it, 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 um, it becomes kind of apparent to you that, that, you are not in any danger, but that this um, the there's this rustling sound up there. You pick it out finally as a human voice. Uh, it is inarticulate, uh, but you know it seems like you know and 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 the there's this kind of rustling sound up there as though uh, you know it. It's not really moving uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it is moving, but it's not moving towards you or away from you or anything like that. It's just like a rustling in the, in the uh, underbrush that's happening. So if it's not anything that seems like a threat, but sounds like a human voice, uh, I'm immediately moving forward to see it as quickly as I can, thinking it might be uh stain yes yeah yeah so um you know and as you move up i would say that this kind of um this kind of pungent woodsy sappy smell gets a little bit stronger and finally you're able to pick out a form that's moving up there and it is a uh roughly 17 year old uh boy that's there um he is missing his shirt and his shoes and uh he's kind of seems saturated um you know with this wet kind of sappy substance and and he seems to be a little bit confused um and is is um kind of in a way, kind of flopping around in the forest over there. Uh, I immediately call the others over and say, I think I found him. Oops, Dentor left. I, I'm going to take this opportunity to go grab a, a second computer. My current laptop is about to die, and I actually don't have a charge cable for it. So, Okay, okay that sounds good. Let's take a break then. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a, a few minutes. I'll put it in the chat and, well. Um, you yeah. always send it to yeah. this bag. Yeah, yeah, I will do that.
Uh, Stenter, we're going to take a little quick break. James had to, uh, his his computer was running low on power and he okay. needed to, to go off too. So we're going to just take a okay. few minutes and we'll be my, back. My computer was in the process of crashing for the last several minutes. Okay. So, so yeah, when we come back, hopefully somebody can fill me in on what I missed. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so about a five minute break? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, is this working? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. 
Uh, I'm on my phone. My okay. other computer is not happily booting up, but I'm on my phone and I can at least like talk and listen and all that kind of stuff. So okay. we can keep going if you like. Okay. Now that that's good. Uh, with the, the role for your party, are you going to need to have somebody? Um, uh, uh, yeah, for rolling, I'll, you can just ask someone to roll for me. But I think in general, I'll, I'll, I think I'll be okay. Okay. I'll figure it out. Don't worry. Yeah. The, the others, uh, I think it, they'll be back in just a couple minutes. Okay. It gives me more time to try to get my other computer in shape here. So Dolan, where where are you from? Where are you broadcasting from right now? I'm from Panama. Okay. Right next to Colombia. Is my inter internet connection being reliable tonight? Yeah, it has been. Uh, there was one time when the 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 audio for a few seconds was clipping a little bit, but for the most part, yeah, it's been it's been good. Oh, that's good. It's been jittery all day. I don't know what's happening. I think my provider is having issues with the connection in, in the area. Okay, and uh, uh, James's uh, video may not be working right now, but James, are you there still? Hey, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to switch to... So that I, I can't get my headset to connect to my computer, but everything else seems to be working, so I'm probably just going to connect on there that way and then use my phone for audio. Okay. So are you good for us to, to continue right now or do you want Absolutely. To... Okay. All right. So uh, back to Strayan. Uh, you see him and uh, he's kind of, uh, as I say, he's on the ground, uh, just kind of flopping around a little bit. Um, he, and he doesn't look like he's in any danger of... I mean, he looks like he's in, from what you can see, is, you know, physically in okay shape. Um, he doesn't have any, you know, sign of injury or anything, except he is kind of saturated in this kind of sappy, watery substance. And you can, right. you can tell that the, this, this kind of pungent, sappy smell is radiating from him. I think I'm... Duncan is going to try and reach out to be as calm as he possibly can about the situation and try to get the kid to come with us. Okay. So I'm going to try and roll hard. Okay. So, How hard do you think the situation is? Um, yeah, and he does, I would say, you know, he doesn't have any sign of physical harm. He does seem kind of very out of it and kind of disoriented right now. So... I'm going to give you uh, two discretionary dice. Mm -hmm. So that would give you, with the two heart, that would give you four. And then if you want to gamble any, that just, that's up to you. I think I'm going to gamble three dice right now. Okay. 
the best odds of success, the better. I I did roll a one. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> so okay. I'm gonna take the narrative narrative impetus. Okay. Um, it's gonna be very short. I just think um, he Duncan is gonna try. He has told stories to Strain before. He probably knows him. Probably saw his, his sister and him back when they were much younger. Um, so he he knows that. He needs to be calm. He knows to be aware of loud noises. He just goes slowly and lets him know, like, hey, thus, how to find here, the surveillance here. And I almost imagine, like, the kid not really paying attention to him until he's, like, close enough to, like, take the kid's hand. And then the kid looks to him. And that's when I'm gonna leave it for you to go on. Okay, yeah. So so Strayan, uh kind of comes back to himself a little bit, and and with you in front of him, he focuses on your eyes, and, and it does. You know, he does seem to be calming. Occasionally, he looks off to the side he looks at auntie pine at velen and, and and he recognizes you you can see that you know seeing all of you there is kind of bringing him back to reality um you know he looks down at at this at his arms and his legs um and kind of pats himself uh that sick sticky substance and um you um also you know as he comes to himself he also occasionally you see him kind of really glancing up to the north i mean you you can't see really much through the woods up there but he's clearly kind of looking off to the north as though he wants to try to see something there. How does Twigs feel him? Um, I would say that the Twigs, um, you don't really feel them pulling anymore. That they seem, you know, they seem to have kind of stopped their pull in this particular area. And and that that really happened as soon as you really got right up on to Strayan. I uh I pull it out, I pull out the twigs and hold them in my hand, and I I kneel down by Strayan and I say, uh were these gifts to you? And uh, yeah, Strayan, um, he sees them and, and he nods and he says, yes, yes. And, and he reaches out and uh, touches them and, uh, and he says, gifts, yes. They were okay. Uh, I, I let him. I let them take it, them out of my hands, and I, I ask him. Uh, tell me. Tell me more. I just. I just leave it open ended. Okay. So Strayan. Um... Strayan has never been a particularly communicative person. I mean, he's kind of the, the, the type of person that, uh, you know, was always kind of seemed to be kind of off in his own world and um, presented some 
everybody knows that he presented some challenges to his parents growing up. Um, and, um, I mean, and, and the problems are not because he was a bad kid or anything like that, but you know, that, that people had a hard time kind of understanding him, communicating with him. Uh, and so, you know, he's, um, he's very, I would say that, that he is, um, he does thank you. He says, thank you. Uh, these are gifts. Um, and you also hear him say, um, there is trouble. There is trouble. Is there trouble coming from the north? Um, he says, I, I, don't, I don't know okay. where it's coming from. But right now? I think it's best that we take you back to your parents. You have been gone for a while, okay? And and when when you when he hears about the parents, uh, he is um, he seems to be a little bit nervous. It's like my parents, um, my parents, um, but but he does say yes. Yes. But Nobody's mad. All right? Nobody's mad. They just want you to come home. Is that okay? Um, uh, yes. I, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I have some cheese. Do you want some cheese? Yes. Yes. Don't confuse him. He's... Piece of cheese. Okay. Is he dressed at all? Well, he has, um, I mean, he has his pants on. Um, that's about it. I mean, he has. Duncan is going to take off like his, his coat, put it on the kid. Okay. He will worry about these things later. It's fine. Okay. And look at Auntie Pine and, and, like perhaps talk once he's home. Yeah, so I think Auntie Pine, you know, he seems to, this kid seems to still be in in a bit of distress and, and not quite with it, but Auntie Pine does have some experience with healing here, so I think she wants to kind of give him a little bit of medical attention to get him um, uh, straightened back out. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you'll get one for that. And, um, you know, he, he, I mean, he seems like uh, he's been, um, as I say, there, 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 it wasn't like you see any kind of signs of like physical harm on him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think some healing, some healing magic would, would do him well. So you're going to get three discretionary dice for that. Okay. And, and then, then I'm going to go ahead and gamble a couple of mine. We're getting close to the end here. I might as well gamble a couple of mine. Uh, so we'll roll six total here. Okay. Okay. If your party is slightly freezing on me, yeah, come on. You can do it. My computer is badly in need of a restart, and I didn't have time to do it before the game tonight. <laughs> See my dice come up there. <laughs> Let me know. Were you able to get it to? There we go. Oh, okay, now I can see it. Uh, I see I've got at least one one on there. So okay, we're good. So uh, do you want to take uh, add a die or do you want to take a monologue? 
Um, I'll go ahead and take a monologue. Okay. Um, so I think the um, the Antipine kind of uh, kind of wraps uh, wraps her arm around him and um, starts kind of whispering, uh, kind of soothing things in his ear and um, touches the the you know, that sap kind of stuff that's on him and uh there starts to be this uh kind of like a flame that kind of dances across him that you know isn't like isn't burning like to hurt him or anything but it's just kind of consuming that that sap and removing it from him and kind of lifting this uh you know, whatever this is that's uh, making it hard for him to um, be his his usual self. Um, and so he kind of shakes his head and, and comes to after this kind of uh, fire has passed across him. Okay. And, and you know, with, with that, uh, you know, the you know, he clearly kind of gets his bearings and, um, and he, he thanks you and says, um, it's, uh, the wooden, the wooden are in danger. The wood What's happened to them? Um, and, and he, uh, and he, and he points to the North and he says, they, uh, they have talked to me and they are worried. Uh, they um they are are being hurt hurt by who and, and and he's frustrated i mean he he's shaking his head and he says um i i, I don't know who just something something I, I i can show you yes please show us Okay, and and when you when when you say ask him to show you, he wants to go off to the north, and he says, "Come, come." Yeah, I'll I'll follow him. Okay, so so you know he takes off. Are are, are the uh, are the rest of you uh, trailing behind? Yeah, but I make sure to tell him to stay close. Yeah, I um, Duncan is keeping an eye on the kid. Uh, just make sure that he doesn't get hurt. Okay, so he he starts walking off, and uh, he's going at a you know now that he's been healed and he's gotten his uh, equilibrium, he's 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 not running, but he's keeping a pretty good pace through the forest. Uh, and it's a little surprising, I suppose, that, I mean, given what what condition he, you found him in, that he was doing this, that, that, he's, that he's moving so quickly. Uh, he definitely looks like he, he's good at walking through the forest. Um, and he's, he's not afraid. Um, and as he walks, uh, you start to hear some rustling sounds coming further ahead of him. And uh, those rustling sounds um, 
I would say they start off in in front, but then you also off both to the left and the right kind of hear kind of some some rustling sounds in the woods. And once again, I dart ahead and put myself in between everyone else and the sounds. Okay. Uh, do you want to use another uh, protective of others uh, move? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So if that's the case, uh, you'll get two for that. And uh, you'll get two uh, discretionary dice for this. I'm going to go ahead and gamble two dice. I'm going to clear the dice roller out here, if, if that's okay. Okay. And I failed. So I think I lose those two dice then? Yes, you do lose those two dice. And I get the narrative. Um, so, um, you see, um, okay, so you have the, the, the kind of rustling sounds in front of you and to the left and to the right. Um, you see in front of you two of the wooden appear and they um they they can the wooden can move quite quickly i mean w when they want to i mean they, they are these kind of tree looking people um and uh they uh very quickly kind of run up uh, to Strayan and uh, there are two of them and uh, Strayan when he sees them is kind of running up to them and they now kind of reach out and uh, grab Strayan. So Valen, at this point, what do you do when you see that they have Strayan? You know, my instinct is to make sure they don't take him. But at the same time, he obviously considers them close. So, so in the context of this, it's I fail to get in front of him, and he rushes out ahead. Correct, and and, and now he is uh, has kind of run up to these two wooden, and they have, uh, yeah, they I guess you know each of them with one one hand has kind of or if you call them hands, <laughs> he's kind of, you know, at the end, they have you know, these appendages and they've kind of grabbed him. Does it look like they're going to run? Um, I would say they don't, they don't have facial expressions. <laughs> so you have to read them just by their body language. Um, they, um, They seem to be gripping him. I mean, not to the point of causing pain, but a, a firm grip. And they seem to be intently watching you to see what kind of a move you're going to make. Okay. Uh, I think of this, I'd relax and call out to Strain to ask how to speak with them. Um, so uh, Strain says 
Um, he looks at, at, at these the wooden on either side, and he um, he seems to get like this intense concentration in his face, and he mutters something. It's kind of unintelligible to you what exactly. It's a kind of vocalization of some type of creaking sound, like ah, 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 that he is making towards these two wooden. And, you know, the wooden seem to respond to it a little bit. Uh, you know, he seems to, there seems to be like, um, you don't understand what it is. Uh, it looks, it sounds semi-articulate, but really kind of this, strange sound that's coming uh that he's vocalizing and, and and they do seem to be kind of relaxing a little bit and and you also see on either side of you now there on one side and on the other there's two additional wooden who have appeared um oops do we have any way to talk to these creatures? I can try and reach out with my earth magic again. Okay. Do you, if you want to do that, you can you can try. Um, so with this, um, and and your intent here is to try to somehow communicate with them. I think if I reach out with my earth magic i might be able to get across that we want to see him safe but that it's obvious that he wants to help them and that if they need us we can help them too just to try to communicate that because i don't think i can communicate it through him okay so it, uh I'll give you one discretionary dice. I mean, this is the first time you've ever tried to, to do something like this. So that makes it more challenging. So you'll get one discretionary dice and, and you have the two for the earth magic. And I can gamble my own dice for his roll, can't I? Correct. Yeah. I am going to gamble three dice on this. Yeah, I was going to dump the rest of my dice in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dump them all. <laughs> so you have three, correct? Crumb? I do. Okay. So that would give you uh, a total of nine. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's do it. I'm going to clear again and then roll nine. Okay. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> okay. So uh, you can either... You get all those... You don't lose those uh, dice, and you can either add another dice to your pool, or you can monologue it. Uh, you know what? I'm going to monologue it. Okay. Um, so I reach out slowly with my magic, and I let the magic flow through the ground to them in a way that I think that they will recognize as uh, sort of like how the earth speaks to the trees that kind of concept and a feeling of just sort of like uh, health and explaining to them through the magic that you know we're here for him and he's here for them and because of that they we, we are also here for them to help in any way we can uh and and uh I feel like there's a lot of resistance to this. There's there's this very sudden jarring feeling of like, you know, this is the first contact and there's it's very uh, strange for them to uh, feel like there's, you know, something other than themselves who are communicating with them. Like there's this isn't this isn't clean in any regard. But I can sort of feel like I'm putting a lot of emotion into this, a lot more than I normally express, because I'm able to do it through my magic. Like, I don't, I'm not a good speaker in general, so 
I feel like uh, I'm helping by doing this. It's actually helping me get them to understand that we're a part of the village and we're here for all of them if they need us. Okay. And I feel like they accept that. Yes. Yes. And with that communicated to them, um, uh, there are these, there are these four wooden, they, they all gather around Strayan and they all seem to be insofar as you can tell exactly what they're doing. They, they, they are all facing Strayan and they all touch him. And, um, Strand seems to get this look of clarity in his eyes. And uh, he starts to speak. And he says, They, the wooden, are facing some type of evil. They, the wooden, don't understand the evil that they are experiencing. They can show you the marks of the evil. And when he says that, um, a couple of the wooden um, point to parts of themselves. And, you know, they, they normally have this kind of brownish to grayish color. But you can see where they point that there are signs of rot that they have. Um, that looks very different from, you know, the rest of them. You know, they're like in, you know, one of them in, in his side, the other one, like where it's not a kneecap, but it's, you know, kind of where like one of his legs articulates and you see these kinds of, of rotted areas. And when, when you see that, if you look at the other ones, they also have these kind of spots of rot that you see. And, um, and, and, and. Strayan says they, they are friends with me because they need you or they need help. Um, and they are um, wary of people they are uncertain of people but they didn't know where to turn and they need uh they need some type of ally so um so I think yeah. Auntie Pine is going to reach out and try to use her healing on the nearest one and it's, it's rotted uh, area. Are you sure that's the best idea? I, I ask as you reach out your hand, they might be afraid. I didn't want to say it either, but you are well known for, you know, associating with hot things that wood is not fond of. Fire is part of the natural cycle. And wood burns and it grows back again. Okay, I trust you. But I'll, I'll leave it up to our GM to tell us if they <laughs> allow me to touch them. Um, I um
why don't we do this? Um, Duncan, as a preliminary, um, if you want to use some heart. Do that I want to, yes. <laughs> to achieve what exactly? Well, I, I'm thinking if, if you want to use, if you think this is a good idea and wanted to assist in this effort um, and to kind of calm them, to make them be accepting of the fiery healing touch of Auntie Pine, mm. uh, you know, you could, uh, you, could, you could use your heart to see if you could kind of get them to be accepting of this type of an attempt. I'm done for that. Okay. Let's do it. How hard will this be? Um, I'll give you one one dice for the for the GM, and then you'd have the two heart. So that would give uh, you three. You know, let's go all in. I'm gonna gamble all five of my dice. I will try and help with my magic. I'll give you two dice. Yes. So that that gives you ten. Apparently. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me delete these ones and then submit. Whew. Oh, there, there it is. A single one. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> well, I tell you, I mean, you think with, with gambling that many, but when I played this before, there was like a big gamble and they lost it. Right. And it was, you know, devastating, but yeah, so you get you got the one. It's probably maybe good you you yes. you, you gambled so many. So um, you can you can narrate this now. I, I like what do you what that. do you do to you, well, well you can either if or you can take the extra dice if you want if you want the extra dice. I think I'm gonna take the narration on this one. Okay. Um, so I think that what he does is that he finds the one that has like the rotting pieces on it and it looks, he looks at the kid first. Um, so he can let them know that we're friends and then the little creature gets into my palm and I very slowly take it to Auntie Pine, really like, and I'm taking some narrative control. It's not like as much heating as you're burning the rotting pieces away so you can let them grow back mm -hmm. healthier. So you're basically taking away the pieces that are keeping them from healing back. Right. Okay. All right, and then uh, Auntie Pine, if you want to now uh, try your healing, and um, you get one for that. Um, you've never done this type of healing before, so I will give you one GM dice. So that would give okay. you two. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and gamble all four of my pool. I'm also going to contribute too, as I continue using my earth magic to try to help. Okay. okay. So that gives you eight. Yep. So things freezing up on me again. And Stenter, if you need uh, somebody else to work the role for your party, let us know. Is he frozen? He's frozen. It's a cliffhanger. <laughs> All right, since this is freezing, I'm going to, I've got a dice roller on my. System here. Nice, and I got a single one. On <laughs> so this game yeah, is scary. 
you for the extra <laughs> 50 days. That is. The center, you are breaking up on us. Is he freezing up on you too? Yeah. So. Are they back? I don't know. I mean, we could. Um... We could call it here, could we? <laughs> no, I don't want to call it here. I'm wondering. We we could take a, a few minutes and and uh, see if he can reboot it. Okay. I feel like we're on the verge of a good stopping place, but I, I really would like to <laughs> have the yeah, cool time. Same. Let's try and hit that awesome ending. <laughs> Let me, I, I'm going to try to message him because if, if it would just take him a couple minutes to reboot, uh, I could do that. Gotta say, at first I was doubtful about the rolling system until we started helping each other out. Then it clicked. Yeah. Now it clicked with me. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's, he's, uh, let's wait and see what happens. Um, it's really cool when you're like doing things that benefit each other. And it's not really a matter of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing the aid another action. It's like, no, I'm building on top of yours. And I, you're loaning me actively your effort. And there's something lost if, if, this doesn't go well. Yes. So it, it has more weight than just being like, hey, I'm going to help you this turn. That's my action. Goodbye. It cost me nothing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, it's rad. Yeah. And, you know, as, you know, the, um, you can never make it so that it's really absolutely certain i mean you can obviously increase the odds but we had two rolls right there at the at the end where it's like okay those you know you rolled so many but you know there was uh you know just one victory on those <laughs> yeah yeah it, it it's very interesting and very liking this very much liking this system i, I want to run something with this <laughs> <laughs> the you know and and well you know, going forward, you know, we have ver the variations. One of the variations reverses the gambling system so that when you get a victory, you lose the gamble dice. And if you fail and you have gambled some dice from the pool, you get to keep them. Which is <laughs> kind of an interesting interesting twist yeah 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 hmm. i really want to keep playing this game see how that goes all right i gotta He say He says um, his his computer is totally frozen up. Um, 
And he says, go ahead and finish the session without me. I've been enjoying it, but I know we're close to the end. Oh, that's such a shame. Um, but he's about to heal. <laughs> I know. And he just know. He got his victory. Leave a woodland creature. I, I don't I don't feel comfortable moving on without him. <laughs> I legitimately don't. Yeah, I I don't either. I, I think he is uh I think he is gonna be back next week. So I mean what we could do is let me just double check and make sure because if that's the case, we could just end it here on something of a cliffhanger, although we know it's gonna be successful. But you know, because he he could get a a monologue of victory if he wants it. Yeah, he's right now. He signed up for next week. I mean, does that seem like the thing to do? Is to you know just come back and we'll we'll like cut it mid scene, and we see we see this fire starting to work on uh, that rotted spot. Like it's working, right? You get a sense it's working, but we're on the on the edge as to exactly what the outcome of this this act of healing is going to be. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. What'd be funny is if if you play this up by like cutting the end of the video to before his role, and then <laughs> putting the role at the beginning of the next session. We're working in post. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll I'll let him know that that we'll. Um, uh you know we will uh pick it up with uh that next week so he can spend a full week thinking about his monologue of victory and exactly what what he wants uh what he wants to do with that okay uh, yeah that's good yeah well, that's great yeah let me um let me just quickly do that and then we can maybe do a quick little uh debrief if that's okay um so let me the right one here. All right, so I've sent the message. Um, yeah, so um, why don't we just, uh, first of all, uh, we can just get reactions to the game. It's uh, the, the mechanics of the game, like the pool itself and your reactions to that. And then we can maybe do um, uh, stars and wishes because, uh, Dolan, you're going to be back next week. Is that right? Okay, and yes, James, and James, you're you're uh, you're not going to be able to be with us. Is that right? Uh, no, I think I could do it. I think I just didn't RSVP to all the sessions for some reason. Okay, okay. Uh, is there still room? Um, well, even if there was not room, I would say uh, you you are included. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can use your plus one privilege. Yes. <laughs> Firebase app. There we go. I'll go shuffle myself onto the events. I don't really, I think because this was my first one, I was like really timidly just saying, okay, I'll do one. And then like, now I'm like, I'm ready to do the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I would say is if, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I would love to have you again. And so, you know, it, if, if it's on the wait list, just put yourself on the wait list. Um, but you know, I think that there's there's room for you definitely if you want to be in uh, for upcoming sessions. And one of the great things about this system is that it's, it is simple, 
mm -hmm. enough that it's easy to explain and it doesn't take like a lot of work to get everybody on the same page. So a large group wouldn't have issue with this, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I like how it's really so wide open. I mean, that that re really like the way that that you define what your attributes are, and then you you know you have that interesting thing of like how do you bring those different attributes into play uh, in the game, kind of looking at at your opportunities to to be able to kind of draw upon those different uh, elements. And a lot of them are, are really kind of strange elements that would never be a kind of attribute in a norm, you know, in some typical game that had predefined, you know, what the what the different attribute classes would be. Of the generic systems that I have tried, I think I like this one the best because it's simple enough that it's very easy to understand, but deep enough that you could do a lot with it. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be like that at first glance. It seems very bare bones initially, but when you get to the gist of it all, mm -hmm. it is very smooth in the way it flows. To the point I'm confused of how haven't I heard about this game before? Yeah. Well, and my sense is that the, some of the ideas of the game kind of got incorporated into other games, but you know, this game itself, the, the, the guy who did the game, I mean, he, this was in the days of the forge forum and he just like, I think one day just posted it to the forum. <laughs> and a lot of the people who were on that forum in 2001, you know, some of them really thought it was, really cool what what the game was doing and then they started kind of like incorporating some of those elements into their own game i i love the monologues of victory i mean as a gm uh it's really fun and, and also a little frightening for me because it's like okay they're <laughs> you know i don't know exactly where the story is going and then when you know i love the monologues of victory from this side to kind of hear what are the players going to come up with? And then, you know, how am I going to, you know, kind of work with what they have kind of brought to the table and uh, take it forward? Yeah, that's one of the things that I, I had considered initially, like, this, the, the system is solid. The issue is that it requires a lot of mental gymnastics from everybody. Yes. Because... Everybody was wonderful tonight. We all gave it our all when it came to monologues. But I think it might be a little bit intimidating to new players. Yeah. Yeah. Or just getting into it all. Yeah, I could actually absolutely see that. Um, I got my start doing just whole, wholeheartedly freeform role playing type stuff. So, like, doing this kind of thing, it really meshes with me because it gives me the perfect amount of control over like how the scenario is functioning in a way that makes me feel like my control over it is as the character you know as opposed to just wholly free form where you're doing everything and i really like that aspect of it because a lot of free form systems i've messed around with have always felt like they just never really fit as much as just creative shared storytelling so yeah, I like this a lot. Yeah. And there's just, I mean, for me, the, the amount of structure it gives you is just enough, I, I think, you know. it. I mean, because so, it's so kind of wide open as to what you can do with it, but it still does have, you know, with that basic mechanic and your list of traits with the certain, you know, points that you have, you know, there's just enough structure, at least for me, that, you know, it kind of keeps everything uh, organized enough, right? Uh, but still kind of allows for 
you know, all sorts of inventive uh, things. Oh, and I should add, um, and I'll pass this on to Stenter. The way the game operates is that after every session, you can add another 25 words to your... Was it 15? Um, let me just see. I think it's 15. Let's see. So it says, if you have uh, nine dice or more left in your pool at the end of a session, you start the next session with that number. If you have less than that, you start the next session with nine dice in your pool. And James, you are right that you get to add 15 new words to your story, right? Um, so if you want to add 15 words uh, to your story and bring new traits, um, right? They said that they can be new lines or they can be additions to old lines. You can also save them until the end of the next session and then write 30 new words at the end of the next one. So if you want to add 15 words uh, now and, uh, you know, that possibly can add new traits and, and you get uh, nine dice in your pool. So you can also, if you want to keep those dice there, you can, but you can also add them to uh, add to the traits for the next time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, Thanks, yeah, so everybody gets, because uh, I don't think anybody had more than nine, but everybody gets nine dice in the pool and then uh, you have the option of, taking those to get some more bonuses or, and you can also add to your story. Um, for, uh, I wanna just, you know, wrap it up here in a few minutes. Um, any, why don't we do one round of stars and wishes, just uh, if uh, anything or anything's uh, you wanna kind of highlight in terms of what went on tonight, other players. Um, and then if there's anything you want to kind of pass on to me in terms of what you'd like to see next week, let me, let me know. What, what are stars and wishes? So stars and wishes, um, uh, uh, stars would be just things that uh, you want to highlight as being uh, things that you really enjoyed. They could be stars that you kind of pass on to other players, things that you really enjoyed that another player did or some aspect of the game that you were, you know, really appealed to you. Um, and then a wish would be, I see wishes as just um, your opportunity uh, for play going forward. So if there's things that you wish that the GM would do or that you want to see kind of brought into the game, um, you know, like for example, uh, if, there was one of your attributes and you really didn't get to use the attribute, you'd say, okay, well, it would be nice if maybe next week I had an opportunity to be able to use that attribute. Or if you had some ideas about where you want the story to go, that could be a wish. Cool. So, um, uh, Dolan, you, you've done stars and wishes before. Yes, I have. Okay. Well, why don't you uh, Why don't you lead us off then? And, yeah, uh, sure. Um, well, stars mainly to all three of you, Robbie, James. <laughs> you, 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 you were great. I really enjoyed how easily we builded all this narrative together, and it seemed very seamless at the time. But we all just clicked, and that deserves a star in my book. Um, specifically for the portrayal of, of Strain. Extremely good portrayal of that kid. Love what you did with it. And for Wishes, I, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I don't have any particular wish other than continuing to keep on this aura of, of, pure wholesome energy that we have right now, that we are all very caring characters and we care for this community and the people in it. And I really want to see more of that. Like, I have, I have had my share of games where we, everything devolves into fighting and killing things and games in which I can talk to people, like they're actual people. 
<laughs> or a welcome addition in my book. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and and just say that 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 is a star alone. Like the way that we've managed to curate the vibe of the game is just amazing. Because like you said, I've it's so rare to be a part of a game where you're doing things in a way that isn't isn't combat oriented. So it's like very awesome to be able to be able to un unravel, you know, like conflict and mystery in a way that doesn't have to devolve into combat. Even though I was totally ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> um the other the other star I want to say is just uh this was my my first uh gauntlet hangout and honestly it was it went even better than i was expecting and i was expecting it to be pretty good just based on how excited i was from hearing other people's stories so like thanks for for being a part of this first one uh, it means a lot to me um as far as wishes go um I i'm kind of wishing for this to turn into a, a deeper story where uh, we kind of become this village that be kind of gets a, a name for being a, like the people who kind of lift the veil a little bit in the regards of like fairies and that kind of stuff. And we already do that to some degree with just how this, the, this is set up. But it's really cool to sort of like drill into this sort of like first contact style story that we're literally telling. It's like an alien story that's going the right way instead of the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And for that, that I'm I'm hoping that we can continue to see that develop more because uh, that's something that I've just I've never seen in fiction. Period. It's like there's always some kind of conflict directly with whoever the people you're trying to like reach out and connect with. And I feel like we're managing to develop a narrative here that we're able to actually do this in a way that doesn't end like oh now we have to kill each other because reasons you know like even if it means like at some point we end up do we do end up fighting them like it's it i feel like it's never going to be in the sense of like oh now you're my mortal enemy it's always going to be around like very structured around like actually keeping ourselves and our our people like safe and expanding who our people are like that's kind of the mindset it feels like we've got going on and i want to see more of that okay good 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 yeah and and my stars would just be uh crum i'm so happy you you joined us and uh that you had a good experience tonight and you were awesome uh <laughs> and and uh dolan you know i i had never played with you or met you before so um you know and this game going into it is you know from my side as the gm it's like okay is this gonna work right i mean because i i think with some groups this absolutely would be a disaster this <laughs> this game so it's a you know a little it's like okay we're gonna all walk out onto tight ropes together and see if we can pull some magic together and i am just yeah delighted because i i had a a, a wonderful time and i i love i mean i i had like some little ideas of like okay i could throw this thing in here and we'll see what we can do with it but the way that everything was unfolding, I think, was uh, for me very, very satisfying. So, uh, I mean, my my wish is uh, really just for more of the same <laughs> next next week. So, um, yeah, it, it's been really, really an enjoyable evening for me. Um, I do have a question for you. Do you mm -hmm. feel like you have enough control of the story with the way things are going? Uh, I feel like the the system is very predisposition predisposed to uh, give the players a lot of control over where the story can go, which I could see like making it extremely hard to plan anything ahead of time because the players might just throw it out the window even more instantaneously than other games might actually uh, present the ability to. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think um, you know, and and I. Going into the game, I deliberately 
want to not exert too much control. <laughs> I mean, I, I I want to kind of float a few situations out there that I have, you know, I've thought of like, okay, I, I have a few little ingredients here that I'll just float out to the table and see what happens. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if I wanted to have more control, it's set up that I could actually, I could control it more if I wanted to, but I, I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I kind of want to see, I want to walk that tightrope a little bit and, and kind of just, you know, float some, you know, characters out there, some situations out there and just see what, what the table can, you know, do with it and have it, you know, people do some monologues of victory that introduce directions that I haven't, you know, thought of before and then see what, where that will take us. I think it's exciting. Yeah. This is like the kind of game you experience rather than prep for. Yeah. 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 But, uh, it's getting, getting late for me right now. So I think, uh, We'll we'll call a, an end to the evening. Are both of you okay if uh, if I publish the the video? Totally fine. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. Okay. All right. Very good. And then uh, we have our 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 mini cliffhanger, uh, the act of healing. And I'll you know just let uh, Stenter know uh, how things kind of how we left things, and uh, we'll take it up from there next week. Cool. Okay. Good evening. Take care, guys. Cheers. Have a good one.